We're going to be working our way through that chapter tonight. As we get into this chapter, this is what is commonly known as the Olivet Discourse, chapter 24 and 25. And the reason it's called that is because, as we're going to find out in a minute, uh, Jesus taught this to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, which is just on the east side of the temple. And as he gathered there with his disciples, he is actually in this discourse answering a question that they had, and it's the longest answer to a question that we have uh, from Jesus. And the reason is, is because in the Olivet Discourse, in this particular passage that we're going to look at tonight, um, his disciples were wondering about his kingdom. This is what Jesus, in the book of Matthew, as Matthew portrays Jesus and focuses on particular aspects of Jesus' ministry, that he, he wants the Jews in particular, that's who this book is targeted towards, he wants them to know that Jesus is their king, their long-awaited king, their king that the Old Testament had been predicting and prophesying would come to set up his kingdom. So the disciples are starting to get that. They're starting to understand that. But they're still at a place where that whole picture is not very clear. We're going to show you um, exactly how that all plays out. But this is w one of the most incredible chapters in regards to Bible prophecy. And we get this prophecy from Jesus himself. And that's one thing I love about the Bible, that it's a prophetical book. And in the New Testament, the second coming of Jesus is talked about in one out of every ten verses. So it's a major theme about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God declares the end from the beginning. So we have the most amazing opportunity as Christians to read God, God's word and know that he's literally unfolding things that he already said he was going to do. And this is one of the things that gives us, uh, at least for me, the most confidence in the word of God, that it's true. It can't not be true when these prophecies are foretold and then they're uh, carried out exactly as they are um, told in the beginning. So God declares the end from the beginning and then he works it out. So as we sit here today, we have Bible prophecy ahead of us, future Bible prophecy. As we sit here today, we have Bible prophecy behind us. And we can look at the things that were said in the past and see how they were fulfilled. How were they fulfilled in the past? Literally, exactly. So we can look at historically how God fulfilled his, his word in the past. That should give us confidence as we look to the future of how God's going to fulfill his prophecy in the future. So it's important as we look at this chapter to kind of have a, a framework for God's schedule that he's working on in regards to the future. God does have a schedule and in many places in the Bible, uh, we get information about that schedule. Sometimes when we read Bible prophecy, it's, it's in different parts of the Bible, and it can get confusing to kind of piece those pieces together of the puzzle and, and to, to kind of understand in a logical, chronological way how Bible prophecy is going to going to work itself out. The book of Revelation is really good in regards to that, to that in a sequential, chronological kind of order of the way God is working out things. One of my favorite uh, passages, um, you're, feel free to turn there, but I'm not going to be here long. It's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, through, thir uh, yeah, through 27. I'm not going to read all that, but in verse... 
24 of Daniel 9, it says, 70, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So that's the schedule. Bible prophecy is centered around Israel and around Jerusalem. So it's centered around not, not just geographically Israel, but also the Jews. That's why in Daniel, as he lays out the whole future of the earth, he does so in such a way where he takes the children of Israel, the Jews, and he says, you have a certain amount of time until Jesus comes back. So he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. And then he says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So what he's saying is, so there's 70 weeks determined for the nation of Israel. At the end of that 70 weeks, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to make an end to sin. It's going to be a new day, a new kingdom. Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth. So that's what he's saying. And then the next couple verses gives us the exact schedule. So it talks about from the time that the Jews who were in captivity to Babylon, they're taken away as captives. They're out of the city and they're being judged by God, but they're going, and it was prophesied that they would be able to go back after how long? 70 years. So 70 years. So they, they did get to go back. God prophesied that they would. And they, they were then given from that point, from the time that a decree was made to restore and rebuild the temple, from that time, which we know the date, until the time of the Messiah, Jesus, would be 69 weeks or 69 periods of seven years. So we're able to date the time that the temple, the decree was given to restore and rebuild the temple from Artaxerxes. And then we also know the time that in Matthew 21 that Jesus wrote in in his triumphant entry, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And that was exactly the 69 periods of seven years. But then something happens. That 70th week, the last seven-year period, would not be immediate, but there would be a gap. In Daniel, it says that the Messiah would be cut off. And then when the Messiah is cut off, the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us that that was the mystery of a mystery re revealed in the New Testament that they didn't know about in the Old Testament, that there is going to be a church age, that there is a gap between the cutting off of Messiah and then the restoration of the nation of Israel. And so we are in that gap. There's one more week still to come appointed to the nation of Israel, one more seven-year period that's future from today. And when that happens, then there will be seven years and then Jesus will come back at the end of that seven years. So now as we're in this period, this, we've been in this period for 2,000 years now. We've been in this gap where it's a pause has been put on the nation of Israel. They're on hold right now. And God is working through the church. In Matthew, we see how the nation of Israel, we had just seen that, how they have rejected their Messiah. So we can turn back to Matthew. We, we've just seen how they've rejected their Messiah, how 
they attributed, the religious leaders attributed his works to the devil. They were out to kill him. They were out to just put him away. And Jesus, last week, last week in our study, we saw how he's pronouncing woes on the nation of Israel, in particular the Pharisees and the chief priests, the religious leaders who pretty soon in, in Matthew, we're going to see them take him and kill him. So the Messiah, he gets cut off. We're in that time where God now is working through the church. Jesus died, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father. God still has another week or another seven-year period to come for the nation of Israel. When that period comes, that period is actually going to, going to be preceded by an event called the rapture of the church, where the church is taken out. Fundamentally, if you just understand what that last seven-week period is, we read in Daniel that seven, 70 weeks is appointed for the nation of Israel. So Bible prophecy is very Israel-centric, Jewish-centric, fo focus on Israel. And just fundamentally knowing that that seven-year tribulation period, the purpose of it is to bring the Jews back to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that will happen. The Bible tells us that will happen. But now the nation of Israel has sort of been set aside and God's working through the church. That's a mystery that they didn't know about in the Old Testament. Uh, it wasn't talked about much in, in Daniel in that verse in chapter uh, 9. We, uh, it, it tells us that there's a gap in between. It tells us that the Messiah would be cut off and that there would be a pause and something on hold, but they didn't know what that was. And then this mystery was revealed that God would work through the church. That the church would be made up of Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles being non-Jews, and that's what the church is. So the church now is carrying the torch of the ministry of Jesus Christ, the message, the gospel, the word, the truth, that the church has been given that torch, and we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit in order to empower us to take out that message. The end of the book of Matthew says to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And don't forget, teach them to obey the commandments. And uh, Jesus said, Lo, I will be with you always until the end of the age. So as we sit here today, we have future. What's the future for us? If you're a believer, it's the rapture of the church. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, it's a catching up. That's where we get the word rapture. Catching up, um, harpazo is uh, the, the Greek word. Rapturo is the Latin word. But it's a violent snatching. And that can happen at any time. In the meantime, God is positioning the earth for this last seven-year period. He's positioning. That. Those are the things that we're, we're feeling and experiencing now. It's like, wow, this is crazy. What's going on? Why are the, all these things happening? It's, it's because the world's being positioned for this last seven-year period. So the church doesn't necessarily look for the tribulation. We look for Jesus to take us and remove us because the Bible says that the time of the tribulation is considered a time where God pours out his wrath on the earth. And we are told that the church is not appointed to wrath. So there's many reasons we could talk about of why I believe the church is going to be taken out first. But the most simple way is to know that just... The fundamental reason for the tribulation on the earth is one, to God, God through this terrible, terrible judgment on the nation of Israel is to bring them back to himself. That's the purpose. There's no reason for the church to be here anymore. And then the, the second reason is just judgment on earth. And so there's no reason for Christians to be judged in this particular way. So God takes us out. And then the seven-year tribulation period begins with 
a covenant made by the Antichrist with the nation of Israel. That's also in Daniel chapter 9. Um, so the covenant begins the seven-year tribulation period. So with that framework, let's just kind of dive in, and then I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. So chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So the disciples, in Jesus' last few days before his death and resurrection, so we're just right, that's right around the corner. So he's in within his last week. He's already rode in made his triumphant entry. Now he's, he's teaching a lot. He's turning over money changers, tables, um, showing he's, he's not happy with the religious condition and state of the people that should be representing him properly. He cursed a fig tree because it had leaves, but it didn't have fruit, pointing to the nation of Israel that they weren't bearing fruit. They were self-sufficient, self-righteous, uh, not believing in God. They were, uh, in Jesus' words, making converts to their religion and leading those converts to hell by their false gospel, a gospel of works, a gospel of legalism, a gospel of self-righteousness. They became so prideful. They became money-hungry. They became unloving, uncaring. Ultimately, they didn't believe. They didn't believe in God, even though they outwardly uh, had a form of godliness, but they, they were denying God. They were denying belief. So as Jesus pronounces these woes, and they're walking through this temple complex, which would, it would have been just an amazing sight. This temple complex would just be elevated on this platform, on this hill. It would be a, a wonder of the world. It would be uh, covered with gold on the top and marble. It'd be so stunning. The his historians of that time would write about it. And they said, if you haven't seen Herod's temple, which Herod was the one that, that built this temple or rebuilt it or made it to the state that it was, you haven't seen anything. He would basically say, this, this is something for the eye to behold. It, and then for the Jew, is something for them to be proud about. It was something that um, they would look at and see that, that God is in their midst and God has done a work because they put so much stake and value on the structure, on the building, and not on the one in whom should be dwelling in the building, and that's God himself. And so... Herod started building this, kind of rebuilding and adding on and making it to this stature, but, but Herod wasn't a Jew, and so I, that always sort of was a problem for the Jews, that they had their, this temple built by someone who was an Idumean and not a, a Jew. But this, this was the center of their existence. This was where they operated. This is where they thought about God. This is where they did business. And Jesus tells them, as it, it almost seems like the disciples are kind of bragging about it. Like, ch check this out, Jesus. Like, he'd be all impressed by it. And he said, not one of these stones will remain. He's prophesying. And they would be thinking, how would that happen? Because it took about 80 years for Herod to build this temple and to quarry the stones that were being put in place and the size and the perfection of how those stones would be in in place and, and Jesus said not one stone would remain here and that that in their mind that would trigger something and that's important to understand take a look at verse 37 of chapter 23 Jesus pronounces 
this final pronouncement on the Jews. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Remember, he said that this is the final pronouncement because before this, he's been giving them parables about their rejection and pronouncing woes on them, eight woes in chapter 23. And then to wrap all of that up, he says, you weren't willing to come. You should have known this day. You should have known that I'm the one, that this is what has been prophesied and predicted and made clear. And you should have known that. But they weren't willing to come. So he says in verse 38, See, your house, notice he says your house. It's not my house anymore. Your house is left to you desolate. Speaking of the temple. And then he says, For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is so important to understand because the disciples, in their mind, the way that they viewed Jesus setting up his kingdom on earth, which is what they thought he was doing now, in their understanding of, of Jesus' kingdom, the physical kingdom on earth, it was... That there would be a, a time of, of tribulation, which the Jews had been going through for a long time. And that time of tribulation would end with a forerunner who they thought was Elijah, would come before the Messiah. And then the Messiah would come, and then the Messiah would pronounce judgment on the nations that were uh, against Israel. And so you can see, this is what they were thinking. And they, they were thinking, this is it. And when Jesus pronounced judgment on the temple, they were thinking, he's here, we've been in tribulation, the forerunner, John the Baptist, came, Jesus came, and now he's pronouncing judgment on the temple, which they would be thinking he's going to purify the temple and build his own temple the way he wanted it and to build it right. And then he would call all the Jews from all the nations back to gather to Israel. But here's the thing. The way that they thought about this was they didn't think of it in the terms like we think of it. And we know now where Jesus was coming. He came first to save and then second to conquer and reign on earth. They just thought that it was all one thing. That was, that was what they didn't get. And the reason they didn't get that is because that was the mystery that hadn't been revealed, the church age, that gap in Daniel chapter 9. So in their mind, they're thinking all the pieces are in place. This is the thing. Jesus is he's going to come now, and he's going to rule and reign now. And so as they're moving through the temple... After Jesus pronounced that the temple um, would be destroyed in uh, chapter 23, verse 38 and 39, they were, they were showing him the temple because they are thinking in their mind that this is, this is where the kingdom is going to be. This is the temple. We're not sure how this is all going to work out, but if he's going to destroy it, he's going to raise it up again. And so Jesus first gives them a, a, a near prophecy. And the near prophecy was that that temple that you're looking at, it's going to be completely destroyed. So then that's what spurred on this question in, in verse 3, which really is what chapter 24 and 25 are all about. So now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so now they moved away from the temple and they're on a Mount of Olives, which is just across from the temple. And the disciples came to him privately and they said, Tell us, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, so they knew this was it. So they're, Jesus, tell us, how, how do we know? Because they, they thought it was immediate. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, it says that they thought that Jesus was going to immediately set up his kingdom on earth. So that's what they're thinking. They're thinking all these things that Jesus was talking about, it fits perfectly. And they didn't see a, a gap between Jesus paying for our sins and then coming later, which now we're in that gap. And so they, they thought immediately this is going to happen. So they're asking him, so Jesus, when is this going to happen? And give us a sign and, and let us know. So really the whole rest of the chapter is Jesus saying it's not now. That's really what this is about. It's Jesus saying this is for the future. This is something that's going to happen later. And it, it's even later from now. So as we look at these last, uh, last verses, as we go through these, what Jesus is doing now is he's trying to really instill in the disciples that he's not setting up his kingdom on earth right now, that that is going to be future. But as he does that, for us as we sit here today, what it gives us is it gives us a prelude to the conditions that are going to be going on in that last seven years. Remember that Jesus is not talking about signs that precede the rapture. This whole chapter is about his second coming. However, as we see the signs that are the prelude or the things to look for before he comes back a second time, and we are seeing things that look like that now, then it gives us an idea of even how much closer we might be now. So let's take a look and see how Jesus lays this out. So he says in verse 4, as he starts to answer their question, he said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and I, or I'm sorry, and, and will deceive many. So now we're in the tribulation. Now we're looking at, because he's asking, or he's been asked for signs. Give us signs, and that's what he's doing now. Give us signs so that we can know that you're going to come to the earth soon. And they're thinking it's immediate. Now Jesus is starting to, to point out to the future. And that will be more clear as we go along. But he says, one of the characteristics that you will know and will, will be really obvious is that there will be a time of deception. And of course there's always been deception on the earth, right? There's always been that sort of thing. But in, in the tribulation, there's going to be a deception that has even supernatural elements to it. And that's why the Bible says to test every spirit. That's why the Bible says not to believe every spirit. That's why the Bible says that even Satan can do signs and wonders. So if our faith is based on our feelings or our emotions only, then we are susceptible to be deceived. And we see that now. We see... In the Western church culture, we see a, a, a falling prey to this sentimentalism, emotionalism, people not being able to be uh, grounded in God's word, not having ears to hear what God says, and really wanting your ears to be tickled more, wanting a sensation, wanting uh, someone to just comfort you in your sin or help you have a better life in the world and not focus on the things of God. 
And uh, it's, it's funny because someone told me recently, I won't name any names, but they said, you know, I first started coming to church here and I would sit there and I would be agitated. And as this spirit in me was agitated because I was in sin and I didn't like hearing what you're saying, I said, praise the Lord. Because that person now, partly because of the agitation and the conviction in their heart, they've come to a great place in their walk with the Lord. And God has brought them out of some really difficult, really hard things. And I just thought, wow, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's how it should be. Like we, if we're in sin, the Word of God is like a mirror, right? It should convict us of our sin. We, we shouldn't be able to be comfortable in our sin without repenting from our sin. But as, as we read this, there's going to be this time of deception. And this time of deception partly will be uh, people... It says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So in the tribulation, there's going to be people that are wanting power and control and to be followed. And because of that, then they'll use the name of Christ and even saying, I am the Christ. People are going to be so desperate that they, they will be vulnerable. And that, that's what happens with a lot of false teachers in our day. They take advantage of people who are desperate. And that's one of the sad things about it is people that are, are vulnerable. They're having terrible financial uh, conditions. And somebody says, well, if you send me money, then I'll pray for you and you'll be rich and you won't have financial problems. Or somebody who's desperately sick and, and they say, well... Pay me, send some money in, and I'll send. I'll pray on a cloth, and I'll send it back to you, and God will heal you. And it's just when you're you're desperate, people take advantage of you. But that's going to be the condition in the tribulation. Is there's going to be a de uh, there's going to be a, a definite time of desperation, and people are going to struggle to find help and to find answers. And there's going to be all these people popping up saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. And, and people are going to fall for it. And Jesus is saying, during this time of deception, don't fall for it. So we're, we see that today. We see all kinds of deceptions. We see all kinds of books and movies, Christian quote-unquote movies, books, all sort of things that are not biblical. And they're, they prey on people. And people fall into that. People are vulnerable to those things. Why is that? I think the biggest reason is because people aren't into the Word of God. And people aren't willing to let the Word of God be the authority in their life. And so, when we have a form of godliness where we say things on the outside, but yet we're not surrendering our will to God, then we're really just worshiping ourselves. And a person like that can be deceived. So God says, be very careful of that. And think about this. As we sit here today, these things are going to be like a roadmap for people in the tribulation. So when you're in the tribulation, they're going to be like, what do we do? I heard the Bible talks about this. I heard Jesus said something about them. They're going to be looking at this. Think about it. That's crazy, isn't it? They're going to actually be looking at this. They're going to be huddled in caves. And they're going to be looking at this like, okay, there are going to be a lot of people who say they're Christ, but don't believe it. Don't be deceived. We're here because we were deceived. We're here because we denied Christ. We're here because we weren't willing to fo follow Christ. But not now. Let's not do that again. Not everybody's going to do that. But in the tribulation, people are going to be looking at this. But you know, when I was thinking about that, I'm thinking, 
Do we do that now? Paul, John, Peter, Matthew, Mark, they, they all wrote things before for us now. And I'm thinking, it was like a road map too. And I'm thinking, we need those things now. And that's what the Word of God is like for us now. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And it, just like those in the tribulation, which for us, we're going to be in heaven with Jesus for seven years enjoying our time with Him while the earth is going to be going through the worst time that the, wor the earth has ever seen combined with all the things that the earth has ever th seen combined, it's going to be worse than that in the tribulation period. The time that the earth has never seen before. So then he says in verse 6, he says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Or that word is birth pangs or labor pains. So Jesus is explaining that this time on earth called the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, this last seven year period, which we can parallel this with the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19. This is going to be a time of mass chaos from every imaginable way that we can think of. And, you know, now we're starting to feel, at least I am, it's like, like being in a boat and you have a, a social problem, a cultural problem, and you plug the hole and then two more holes open up and you plug those holes and then that other hole starts leaking and then you have two hands on the two holes you put your foot on the other hole and then another hole opens up and you put your other foot on that. You have your two hands and two feet on the four holes and then five more holes open up. That's what it feels like now. We're getting hammered. We're getting assaulted from all different directions, culturally, spiritually, socially, uh, whatever you want to say. This, this time in our, in our country, not in the country, in the whole world. That's what's interesting. The whole world's going through this. And it, it feels like just this craziness, this, this um, bombardment with things that are going on. And this isn't even near close to anything like it's going to be in the tribulation. And in the tribulation, so he, he says it's going to be like birth pang. So that means these contractions, like a woman in labor that's going to bring forth a life or bring forth a baby. The tribulation is like that because it's ushering in or bringing in the the millennial kingdom or God's kingdom. And the comparison is just this, just tremendous pain, tremendous upheaval that's bringing or birthing a, a new age, a new time on earth. But it's going to be intense. And he's saying, he's saying when these things happen, it's not the end yet. He, and the reason he says that is because when all of these things happen, the final... Great tribulation has not been triggered yet. There's a, this is leading up to this, this trigger, which we're going to see in a second. So the people on earth are going to be experiencing these problems that increase like labor pains and get more intense. And when that happens, that's the sign that Jesus is saying. He's telling his disciples... That in the future, that's the sign. When things like this start going on and are start get going to be so overwhelming, 
then that's the sign. You know something's coming. So then he says, in verse 9, he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So we see, we've always seen persecution of believers. But in the last hundred years, we've seen more people persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ in the last hundred years than we have in the previous 2,000 years. But in the tribulation, there's going to be believers. The believers that are in the tribulation become believers after the tribulation starts. Because the believers before the tribulation starts are going to, going to be taken out of there. The tribulation for many people is what's needed for them to have a real faith. Some people, they won't believe in God. They're unwilling to come to God. But now that things are going on, and maybe somebody told them about these things. Maybe someone said, have you heard about the tribulation? Have you heard about the book of Revelation? Have you heard about what Jesus said in the Bible? Have, have, have you heard that you know, Jesus is going to come back for his church and then there's going to be the time of just terrible things going on. A lot of people are already thinking about that, right? So the, the opportunity to witness to people is very great right now because people are thinking about it and we know what's going on. So this is a prelude. What we experience now is a prelude or precursor or a setting of the stage for things that are going to happen in the tribulation. But it seems like the things that are happening now are pretty far advanced. In other words, like if you were setting up a stage for a play, the stage is pretty much set. Like you just need to turn on the lights and say act one. That, that seems like where we are. The things are so crazily in place, which tells us that we could be getting close to that. But he says there's going to be this, this almost hunting of believers. They're going to be hunted. This tribulation, there's going to be a, almost a, just such a deep-seated hatred of, of Christians. And the Bible tells us that when the church is taken out, that the restrainer is going to be taken out as well. What's the restrainer? The restrainer is the Holy Spirit working through the church. So that's one of the things that restrains evil in our society. And that's, that's also why society, uh, in many cases, hates the church so much, because they're restraining the evil, and they bring conviction. You may have friends or family members, and you don't even say anything. It seems like they're mad at you all the time. It's because they may be convicted. They may be uh, upset, just because of the light that you have in your heart. But in, in the tribulation, Christians are going to be hunted. And remember, many Jews are going to come to faith in Christ as well. Verse 10, it says, Many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And so in the tribulation, this message of the gospel is going to go forth powerfully. How is that going to happen? Well, a couple ways. So there's going to be the 144,000 Jews who are sealed by God so they can't be killed. And they're going to be uh, protected and gifted by God to carry out the gospel message. And these 40, 144,000 are going to be specifically gifted to do that. So that's one of the ways the gospel is going to go out. In other ways, there's going to be angels flying to and fro throughout the earth preaching the gospel. 
And so the gospel is going to go out throughout the whole earth. There's another reason that uh, does, there's no reason for the church to be there because we don't need the gospel. We have already been saved and, and they're going to have the angels and the 144,000 preaching the gospel. But it's going to be a, a, a time where, where this great tribulation is going to also bring about a great multitudes of those being saved as well. So then in verse 15, it says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. So Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 12, it it speaks of this thing called the abomination of desolation. This is the trigger. This is the flashpoint. This is the thing that is going to be at the halfway mark of the seven year period, which is three and a half years. And what's going to happen is in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be maneuvering, positioning. He's going to maneuver himself to position himself for power. And he's going to do that as he makes a coalition in Europe. And he's going to head this 10-nation confederation. He's going to be in charge of that. And then he's going to make this alliance with Israel. They think that he's going to protect them. And at that three and a half year mark, what he's going to do is he's going to go into the temple and he's going to commit something called the abomination of desolation. And what it is, is he's going to defile the temple. He's going to set up an image of himself and he's going to demand people to worship him. Before that, he is coming with a pseudo peace. He is coming, you know, kind of, uh, kind of like we see today, you know, that Many governments in the world say, we want you to be safe and we're here for your safety while they're sucking your freedom away. But we'll take care of it. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about anything and, and that sort of thing. So there's a reason that that is going on on a more global scale in our world because really what you're looking at is two different religions. You're looking at religion of those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which I don't even know if you call that a religion or not, but you get the point. And then there's a religion of humanism, which takes on a lot of different forms. The religion of humanism is what's sort of embedded in our culture, and it is a religion with a belief system, but it's not considered a religion, and that's why it's allowed to proliferate in all the different uh, sections of our society, whether it's education, entertainment, government, um, corporations, whatever, because it's not considered a religion, but it is. It's the religion of humanism. That's what the final religion is going to be. And that's why the Antichrist is going to set up an image of himself after he's gotten the confidence especially of the nation of Israel, but of the world. And then he's going to turn on the Jews specifically, and he's going to demand people to worship him as God. And the only way that you will be able to participate in society is if you worship him and get the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is 666 because it's the number of man. This religion is humanism. It's uh, the mystery Babylon, um, the book of Revelation calls it, which is goes back to the book of Genesis where the first man-made religion was created, where they built a tower to try to reach God. The point of that, of the Tower of Babel, was, was we want to be God, usurping God's authority. That's where humanism comes from. And all false religions, all cults, all religions that deny Jesus Christ, 
uh, even secularism. That's all humanism. It's all the worship of self, the worship of humanity. But the government system that needs to be set up is, is communist. Communists believe in a world utopia through governmental control. And so that's why we're seeing global movements towards globalism. That's why I believe the COVID virus is being used as a weapon to bring people into surrender. And can you believe how far we've moved away from freedom in, in our country and in many places in the world in just like a year and a half? The, the forcing of things upon people in the name of safety, which it, it doesn't add up like the punishment doesn't fit the crime, so to speak. It's, it's, it, we all kind of think, well, that seems a little fishy. That seem, doesn't seem like it adds up. Why is this not seeming like it's ad, adding up? It's because there's going to be a one world government. And the, in order for there to be a government that controls things like that, you can't have people believing in a personal God, in Jesus Christ. And that's why communism will kill Christians, because you can't have Christians in a communist society, because they worship an authority above the government. They worship an authority that's higher, and that's a king of kings and the lord of lords, and that's who we worship. So this move towards governmental control is a move towards a one world government, towards really a one world, you could say, world communism, but it's probably even worse than communism when the Antichrist takes over. So in the tribulation, this is the trigger point, this is the flashpoint the abomination of desolation. And Jesus is giving this to his disciples and he's telling them, this is future. These are the signs to look for. There's going to be all these cataclysmic things going on, but that's not the end yet. They're leading to this abomination of desolation. When that hits, that's when the sparks fly. That's when all you know what's going to break loose. So he says in verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When that happens, when the abomination of desolation happens, you need to get out of there. If you're in Jerusalem, you need to get out of there. Where do you need to go? You need to flee and you need to hide. There's a lot of caves in Israel. You remember David was hiding from Saul in all these caves. There's a lot of wilderness. But you need to get out of there. That's basically the, the sense of urgency. He says, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to his uh, clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. One, because it's very hard to travel fast when you have a baby, a toddler, an infant. Two, they're going to be coming after your babies to kill your babies, just like Herod did. So he says in verse 20, pray that your flight uh, may not be in the winter. Well, it will slow you down or on the Sabbath. Why on the Sabbath? Well, if you're in Jerusalem and the abomination of desolation happens and you have to get out of there immediately and it's on the Sabbath, well, these Orthodox Jews, you're not allowed to be uh, far from your house. You're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to, I think it's 2,000 yards away from your house. So if you're fleeing and they see you running further from your house than you should be, they're going to start stoning you. So he said, hope it's not on the Sabbath where it's going to be hard to get out. And they might throw rocks at you and, and try to kill you when you're getting out. So then he says, in verse 21, he says, For there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the... Alexei is specifically talking about 
the Jews, the nation of Israel. But as far as the days being shortened, it's probably referring to the fact that the day, daylight will actually be shortened during that time. There will be less daylight, so you'll be able to hide under the cover of darkness a little bit better. And then in verse 23, it says, Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, it says, do not believe it. So there'll be people trying to get them to come out of their hiding and getting out of their caves and they're saying, look, the Christ is here now. You're okay. The Christ is here. You're safe. And he said, don't believe it. Don't fall for that. He says in verse 24, because false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, if they say to you, look, He's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is there, the eagles will be gathered together. Speaking about, obviously, dead bodies and the eagles that are on those dead bodies. But... So he's saying, and he's giving them instructions. So when you're hiding, abomination, desolation happens. You need to leave as fast. You're going to be in hiding. People are going to try to trick you, even your family. Friends are going to betray you. They're going to say, it'll be okay. Just take the mark. It'll be okay. It's, just, you know, it's, it's too hard to live like this. You know, It's too hard to, you don't have to do this. Just take the mark. And so just, it's important for us to know that in order to take the mark, first you have to be in the tribulation, right? So you can't take the mark now. So there's not a mark now. So there's not a mark now. And you have to knowingly, willingly deny Christ and worship the Antichrist. But when you do that, you'll get a mark and then you could buy and sell. But You've rejected Christ for all time. Whenever you take that mark, if someone were to take that mark, that's it. You can never be redeemed. You're done. Your fate is sealed. So if you're not a believer and you don't plan to be and you're in the tribulation, then don't take the mark and repent then if you want to go through that. That's up to you. But isn't it interesting? This is what's interesting. So, so now we, I feel like we're seeing all these precursors to these things happening. And the thing that really gets me, I mentioned this, I don't know, a while back, not too long ago, but the thing with the vaccine. So the vaccine is not the mark, right? And if you take the vaccine or don't take the vaccine, that's not, that's up to you. It's a personal choice. You pray about it and do what your conscience says and tells you to do. But it is interesting to me that we're getting to a place where you can't buy and sell or travel or if, you're not, if you don't have the vaccine, you can't do anything, right? So a lot of you are thinking about buying campers now because you, you can't fly anymore. And like, okay, we'll just we'll travel to Kansas or something. I guess that'll be our new thing or whatever. But, but isn't it interesting? But I see this just as all conditioning people to, because the bars move so far. You know, th something like this just... Three or four years ago, you just you wouldn't even be able. There's no way that could ever happen. And now we're in a place where it's like you can't work here unless you take this vaccine. You can't work here. That's insane. Well, what if I have antibodies? Does that count? That that doesn't even count. So that there's something there's that's not normal, right? There's something up with that. But it, so it's a precursor. It's, it's getting people conditioned to except what any government person says. And if, if you go against that, you're going to pay the price. You can't buy or sell. But that's the part I find very interesting with the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. You can't buy and sell. We're not forcing it on you. You just can't do anything. That, that's what's happening. It's crazy to me. But anyway, so um, verse 29. So immediately... After the tribulation of those days, 
The sun will darken and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So there's going to be a thing that's going on now in the heavens, in the, the parts of the sky that just seem so powerful and so amazing that they're going to have problems there. And the Bible tells us that God holds all things together. God's literally holding all things together. So as we see the earth and the atmosphere and the solar system and all these things, God's actually holding it together. But one day he's going to let go of all those things. Right? And Peter talks about that. The time where, where God lets go and the earth is going to melt with the fervent heat. But see, we know that's not going to happen if you think the earth, because of global warming, is going to be destroyed. It's not until at least 1,007 years. So we know we have seven years of tribulation and we know we have a thousand years of millennial kingdom. And then after that, God's going to set up his new heaven and new earth. But all of that, again, it's just more of trying to scare people, trying to get people to do things to, to make them more dependent on the government and the things of the government. To set them up for these things. So in verse 30 it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that's how he's going to come in his second coming. He's going to come in power and and in glory, the book of Revelation tells us he's going to come on a white horse and he's going to come with his church. So we're going to be there. So we get to hang out for seven years in heaven with God while the tribulation happens here. And we get to come back as like warriors and with Jesus on a white horse. That's amazing. And it says he will send his angels, verse 31. With the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So what's going to happen when Jesus comes back, what happens is and there's, there's going to be this separation. Separation of the wheat and the chaff, or the believers and non-believers to see who goes into the Millennial kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about. And the Bible in Daniel 12, 11, it, it gives us a, a timing where there's, there's more days. There's like a total of 75 more days after Jesus comes back before he sets up his kingdom. So I, I believe that means so Jesus comes back and then he's going to go through this separation process where he separates true believers and unbelievers at the time of judgment and then he'll set up his kingdom and rule from Jerusalem and maybe that's what those extra 75 days are going to be about but that's for another time so verse 32 now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves you know that summer is near so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. So if you're in the generation that's in the tribulation, all these things are going to take place. And not one of them is going to be left out. And you're going to see all these things happen. And he says... In verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And then in verse 36, he says, now he's focusing on the timing. So remember, they asked for the signs. What will be the signs of your coming? And, and what's the timing of it? When is it going to happen? So he says, no one knows the day nor uh, the hour. No one knows it. 
and not even the angels of heaven, but only my Father. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also it will be that the coming of the Son of Man. It says, two men will be in the field, and one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So what, what Jesus is saying here, remember, this is, this is second coming. This is all about the second coming. But it sounds like he's talking about the rapture, but he can't be talking about the, the rapture because the, the whole thing is all based on the second coming. So what he's saying is, it's very interesting. So nobody knows the day or the hour. So in the tribulation, we, there's a time period. We know it's seven years, and then Jesus comes back. But we don't know when the tribulation is going to start. We don't know when the rapture is going to come. So there's some mystery there. And then if you're in the tribulation, you're going to see these signs, and you're going to, uh, eventually have the abomination of desolation. And when that happens, people are going to be hiding out. People are going to be waiting for Jesus to return. And you know he's going to come at a certain period of time, but not the specific, not the very specific, not the day or the hour. And the whole point of this is to keep people looking. And that's what you see at the end of this is they're, they're, they're to be in a, in a state of preparedness. Being aware, understand Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Live in a way that demonstrates you're looking for Jesus. So for us, the implications are profound, even more so because the rapture can literally happen. There's no signs for the rapture. So it can happen any time. And so as in the days of Noah, and this is what's crazy, even in the tribulation... People are going to be so conditioned to the things of the earth that even with all the crazy things going on, they're still going to be numb to Jesus coming back. And you say, how could that be? I've read Revelation. That's crazy stuff. There's scorpions that, with faces like men that sting people and meteors falling from the ground and killing people and all this stuff. Well, People are oblivious now. Our hearts could get so hard that they'll, they'll probably make all these excuses. They'll probably in the universities come up with a new curriculum to explain all this phenomenon. And, you know, all these uh, secular intellects will have a rationale for all of these things. And it's crazy, but that's happening now. It's happening on people don't believe. If you have eyes to see and you know what's going on, thank God that you're not blind to the realities that some people think this world is it, man. This is, it's going to get better and we can do this and it'll improve this. And, you know, like John Lennon, imagine all this stuff. This place is going down the tubes, right? And you need to jump ship or like in the days of Noah, get on the ship. And be saved. So then in verse, we've got to finish up here. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find, find so what? Doing. Doing. So the key there is, how do we watch and be ready and prepare ourselves for Jesus' return? We do His will. We do His word. 
Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, the one who does his commandments is the one that's stable like a rock. So then he says in verse 47, Assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying in his coming. Jesus isn't coming back. You guys have been saying this forever. I've been hearing that. You, you people, you always say Jesus is coming back. Forget all that stuff. That's, that's what they're saying here. In verse 49, and because of that, because they, they, they don't think about eternal spiritual things, they begin to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. In other words, living as if nothing's ever going to happen. God's never going to come. There's no judgment. There's no eternity in heaven. Live drink and be merry nothing matters that's what they're saying verse 50 the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth so the point is it's coming when we see things going on in the world, we are one step closer to eternity. Live in light of Jesus that can come at any moment. And you will not regret it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And I pray a blessing on them, Lord. Keep them. Watch over them. Make your face shine upon them. And be gracious to them. Write your word on their heart and on their mind. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you on Sunday.